Yeah, no, but thank God for the internet. Yeah. If it wasn't for this, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, I mean, like, we'd be uh, not Jewish. <laughs> you know, we'd be Clyde, forced to go to a shul to hear a class. Huh? Well, that's a good question. Who's Jewish? Clyde Hayes wants to know who's – but who is Judah today? Who's Yahudi? Because we get the name Jew from Judah, no? Is that where it comes from? I've heard people say the opposite. I've heard people say because Yehudi means someone who – who praises God and worships God. I'm not convinced that's, that's exactly what it depicts nowadays. The last kingdom standing was the kingdom of Judah. Now, in that kingdom was also part of Benjamin, part, if I remember correctly, of Shimon, clearly Levi as well, and like we said, Yehuda. Anyone within the borders of the kingdom of Judah was considered a Judean, whether you were from the tribe of Dan who happens to have returned to that area and stayed there because in the time of the Roman conquest, there was no Jubilee. There was no you know, having to live in your certain plot of land. So this is why they were considered, at least according to the text of the New Testament, as Judeans. And that's where Jew came from, from that. It had nothing to do with being genetically from the tribe of Judah. Now, initially it did, but not after the Roman exile. So only because people are called Jewish today, what does it mean that they're all genetically claiming to be from the tribe of Judah? Because, again, we have Benjamin, we have Shimon, we have Levi. So who are Jews today? People who identify with the last remaining kingdom of Israelites, which was the southern kingdom. That's it. It doesn't... Uh... Simple. What What's your understanding of why we don't have prophets today? Of course, Israel is sort of in a weird situation where there's a they're physically in the land, but they're not spiritually in the land. And you would, uh, you know, why aren't there prophets that would come up and, and pretty much chastise the Jewish people for not keeping Torah, considering that there's so many of them that aren't that aren't doing it. Ninety percent are religious. Who says there aren't prophets? You have some rabbis such as Tobias Singer that says the messianic or the prophetic age is over where it ended with Malachi and and there's no one proclaiming that they're prophets. I mean, I guess you can say like the 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 Rebbe of the Lubavitchers, I guess he, he claimed to be some sort of prophet, right? So what does the Torah have to say about this? Before we start to investigate or try to explain any topic, we have to go back to what the Torah teaches. Does, it, does the Torah ever say that the status of the prophet is going to be eliminated? Never. never. Never, right? Does Tanakh say it? Mm, also I never. <laughs> so there's one statement in the Talmud that says that after the destruction of the Second Temple, that prophecy was only given to madmen and children. That's just one opinion. Nowhere does it say that it ended with the book of Malachi, mainly because in the Talmud, the Tanakh wasn't canonized yet. And also the book of Malachi according to the Talmud, it would be the book of Ezra, because they believe that the Malachi is a title for, you know, like my messenger, meaning Ezra, and that, and that just a prophet. But anyways, according to the Rambam, prophethood never ended. There's many people, only because they don't call themselves prophets. Now, there is an understanding, but the Torah doesn't say this. There is a rabbinic understanding that prophecy can't exist outside the land of Israel unless it began in the land of Israel. This is how they teach that Ezekiel could still be considered a prophet because he received his he received Navua initially in the land of Israel. But again, this is more like a rabbinic understanding. The rabbinic has no authority on the metaphysical. They only have the authority on the halachic, halachalamaisa, what you do, not what you believe or anything metaphysical. There is no reason for anyone to believe that prophets are done away with. Now, clearly, there's no books of the prophets. There could be, because no one sanctioned the books of the, of the prophets, the minors, and the major prophets that we have now. Like, where can there be more books written and more things exaggerated of what they did when they really didn't do it? There's prophets. The Talmud says that there were hundreds of thousands of prophets. Again, people didn't have their books right, right. Because, because they weren't written. So if there were hundreds of thousands of prophets back then, why can we assume that there are millions of prophets today? that prominent rabbis out there who are calling people to do tshuva, uh, you know, like unknowing they, as they may seem to many people, could be prophets. Why not? But yeah, absolutely. There's prophets nowadays. I believe that if the Torah doesn't prohibit it, who's to say that well, the rabbis were able to decide that, okay, but no more prophets. And no one's going to question. A lot of, of chutzpah, these rabbis, huh? <laughs> I've also thought about this 
a lot. And also, when I've read dissenting opinions like the Rambam, who teaches that prophecy is not dead, it opened my eyes up that, wow, the rabbis didn't have a monopoly on this interpretation. What else don't they have a monopoly over? It gets me to question other beliefs and realize that I'm not the only one questioning. There's many rabbis who question also. But if you only listen to Tovia Singer or Tanakh talk, you're only going to get one perspective, which is the popular perspective. This is what most people believe, but it's not exactly what the Talmud teaches. But there's absolutely prophets nowadays. Absolutely. There's many people nowadays fulfilling the role of a prophet. Now, there's another understanding. I have a video on prophets where I mentioned this. Where in biblical days, there was supposedly, supposedly, even a school of the prophets. That if someone wanted to be a prophet, there was like, I guess, a course you could take in biblical days or something. Because it speaks about the school of the prophets. I think in Sefer Shmuel. That's almost as bad as paying for conversion classes for, 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 that a rabbi gives. <laughs> well, if a prophet is just someone, like you said, who speaks the word of God. Because the vast majority of things that a prophet tells Israel, apart from the timeline that this is going to happen by this time if, if you don't repent. He's just reiterating words of Torah, right? But when Israel is worshiping idols, you don't have to be a psychic to understand that they're about to be kicked out of the land. According to the narrative, if you're reading the Bible straight through and you see Israel breaking certain laws, one plus one equals two. We don't need a prophet to tell us this, right? It seems that a prophet could very well just be someone who was righteous, who knew Torah well enough to be used as a reminder by God to point him back to the Torah and just to tell him, yes, he's being a mouthpiece for God, saying that God's had enough, but not that he's here to bring in new ideas or to foretell things that are going to happen 2,000 years on the road. All right, so that's how I view prophecy. I mean, someone that, who's reiterating the formula that appears in Torah, because again, Exxon Redemption is a formula. There's nothing prophetic about Exxon Redemption, just the timeline of when it's going to happen, yeah. Uh, we got a really odd uh, question out there. We might have to, you know, s- get a bowl going, smoke a little bit, or to understand what this guy's saying. Uh, he says, if the Talmud and the Quran says that there are five thousand wor- worlds out there with people like us, then why do so many Jews, Christians, and Muslims do not believe in the possibility of alien life? Mm-hmm. First, you of all, ever heard of such a thing? Of Talmud, does the Talmud speak of different people on different planets, uh, or the Quran? Even I don't even I don't remember uh, that. I know Kabbalistic literature does. I have a good friend who's a Satmar Hasid, and, and uh, he would tell me stories. I don't know if it's a Zohar that talks about there's people who live in the earth who come out and they feed off of uh, blood and semen. And this is what it says. And it says they have old oh, little, heads yeah. and big eyes. And it almost describes that people, the depictions of encounters, of extraterrestrial encounters that people have. But but this is Shay these are Shay demons, succubuses. They're they're types of demons. That that's not aliens, are they? Uh, I know what it, you're talking about. I, that, that's not considered from that perspective, you could call God an alien. If angels exist, you could call angels aliens. All right. Aliens just mean it depends okay. on your for a strict definition of the term it's not from this right. world. Not right. From this not world. from this world, I guess. Considering something holy doesn't mean that we're elevating it to a Torah status. I mean holy just means set apart. So from that perspective, the Jews view the Talmud as holy. It's set apart, yes. But that doesn't mean that everything in the Talmud comes from God. Only because there's a metaphysical idea in the Talmud doesn't mean that it's true. And many rabbis will tell you, of course, that we don't hold by this medrash, or we don't hold like that. What does that mean? That you're not taking a story that appears in the Talmud literally. Well, if you believe it's a holy book, then we should take every word literally from a Christian perspective, and even from a Kabbalistic perspective, because many people say, like, what do you mean? It's in the Talmud. No. Things in the Talmud that are descriptive and not prescriptive are not obligatory. The Talmud is there to lay, to bring down the rulings of the court, the rulings. They don't rule metaphysical things into existence. They're not going to rule that aliens exist or don't exist or demons exist, right? They have these personal beliefs, and they could include it in a story as they're presenting a law, but the only thing that's valuable to us in the Talmud is law. So this is why when anti-Semites quote things of the Talmud, uh, the, the best of the Gentiles should be killed. This is not a law. This is a rabbi venting his frustrations. That's disposable. Okay, The law is what Deuteronomy chapter 17 commands us to listen to. Not narrative and not metaphysical concepts. The metaphysical has to come from the Torah because that's... That's the only 
form of metaphysics that could be validated, something that we got directly from God. Okay, the job of a court is to give you law, not to give you advice on whether God is tall or short. So only because something appears in the Talmud doesn't mean that Jews are supposed to take it seriously. But I know it's said many times that Talmud is the second most holy book in Judaism apart from the Jewish Bible, from the Hebrew Scriptures, from Tanakh. Holy in the sense as set apart, but not holy as God breathed. Yeah. Thank you for that. That was a very good answer. That was actually interesting. Uh, 